Good morning, welcome. I'm Sandra Reyes and I'm part of uh, LACNIC staff. Thank you for participating in this uh, previous, uh, um, in this uh, activity prior to LACNIC uh, 37. Today we're going to have an introduction to uh, the Linux uh, console. Today we have uh, Jorge Cano, who's a software architecture architect in LACNIC and he will be in charge of the webinar. Let me tell you that um, um, another activity that we'll have is uh, tomorrow we'll have a webinar on public policies. Um, let me explain how we will work. It is um, estimated that this will uh, last a bit more than an hour. Uh, the idea was uh, that we would have 120 minutes, but uh, it might uh, take uh, a shorter time, so you're going to be free earlier. Let me also remind you that the session will be in Spanish all the time, so that is why we have simultaneous translation uh, into Spanish, English, and Portuguese. You can access this service in the uh, toolbar. And uh, let me remind you that this webinar will be recorded. So later on, you'll find uh, it uh, in the website among the preparatory activities. So this is all for me. Now I'm going to give the floor to Jorge. Jorge, welcome. Thank you, Sandra. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. As Sandra said, I'm Jorge. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, send it. Uh, via the Q&A panel. And today we are going to discuss a topic that in my view is very interesting and it is essential to offer, to uh, administer and uh, to work with uh, um, uh, in the web. And sometimes we assume that people know it. Those of us who grew up using a console or a computer uh, as older people, we uh, it's not so strange. But for uh, the younger people, the first computer had a Windows 95 or, or a graph environment as a graphic environment as Mac. It might not be so natural for them to have access to that kind of uh, commands in text time, and. Uh, Actually, it's a very, very uh, user-friendly thing uh, to use in the, and, and it helps us work with our equipment. Uh, web, um, this, it, this webinar was designed for people who have no experience working with a console that are going to use it for the first time. And maybe you were sort of afraid as to how, complicated it could be or whether it's very difficult to learn. Actually, it's very simple. The console was designed precisely to enhance the flexibility of users so that they can do many things in a simple way. You just have to learn by heart certain basic commands and that will enable you to do most operations. And if not, in the end, uh, it's not necessary to learn everything by heart. I don't know everything by heart. You just need to know that the commands are there and uh, more or less what each is for. And if you want to go any uh, more in depth, uh, you can uh, uh, ask Google or the network. There's a lot of information there. And the console itself has a scheme to, uh, th there are many manuals that you can uh, use. Maybe if the explanations are very difficult. You can also ask in the internet and you find information in Spanish or in uh, your mother tongue. Let me share the presentation. Good. So, as I was telling you, what are the reasons for learning the use of a Linux console? First of all, it consumes a much less resources than the graphic interface. If you are uh, using a uh, network uh, server, well, you can you can do this, but exporting the graphic interface of this from the server 
to the com to your computer will consume uh, many more resources both in the server side and the network side and it's not going to be as responsive as if it were local so learning how to use the console and managing it remotely from the console is going to be much faster and more efficient and from the point of view of security the fewer packets you have in the server side it's a uh, you don't have to do such a maintenance you don't have to worry for so many packets uh, the uh, setup will be faster and when you have to update the server for the new versions of the software it, it takes a shorter time and uh, now we have cloud uh, spaces and you will, won't need so much so it's it's much more beneficial not to uh, uh, to be able to use it for maybe for your everyday computers there you can uh, search to have a graphic interface but uh, not for servers there's no need for it with servers so through the console it's also much easier to manipulate or to manage uh, or handle uh, a number of files at the same time so what you had to do by hand or file by file in a graphic interface usually there are commands that you can edit several files at the same time in one with one single command and you don't have to do it manually it's also possible to create uh, skips for repeatable tasks i don't know whether you have found that there are three, four, five servers and all of them must have the same web server or the same setup uh, or the same content. And doing it manually with each of the servers may take a long time. It may be very slow. You may be prone to errors because in a server, maybe you uh, forgot to click uh, on something and it's much more simple to create a script running all the commands serially. You can run the second one or the third one and you can control several machines at the same time and standardize them so that they all have the same thing because the script will make mistakes. The script won't forget to run a command and it won't forget uh, and it won't write uh, with a typo or other types of human errors. And it's very much easier to manage several machines at the same time through scripts. There are also several tools like Puppet and Ansible that go one further step. In your personal machine, you can control several servers at the same time through scripts, but ultimately, as you know how to manage the console, it will be much easier to learn how to use these tools compared to when you have a lot of servers. So it's most uh, advisable to use this and not several servers, servers manually. Auditing and debugging errors is much simpler. Normally you have a graphic interface machine, you have um, there's an error and it says error 481, for example, and what is that? You might ask yourself. So it can be more difficult when Googling to see what these errors are through the console. You have access to all the logs, to the log of all the errors. It's much easier to detect these, to learn, and to obtain much more information on what is happening in the machine below the graphic interface in order to find errors and to correct these. And finally, as I was saying when I started, it is indispensable if you intend to work with the cloud. I don't like the term cloud, but it is here to stay. If you rent space virtually, if you have your servers in a data center, or if you are considering accessing the cloud system or remote servers, a large number you really should try to, I mean, trying to use these with a graphic interface is almost impossible. So you have to learn the basics about the console and it is not so complicated. It looks much complicated than what it really is. Now I will speak about the concept of Linux. We see the uh, authorizations, uh, groups, and for people who are not so familiar with this, so that you can see 
the concept of how the operating system works. At the end of the day, if you're familiar with this, it serves as a review. It's not very complicated. These are very basic things that I will go on to explain, but and can be very useful to understand why you should run certain commands in a certain way or why my command does not work if it used to work correctly previously. So maybe this has to do with authorizations that explain this. Linux has three types of users. The first is the main user, which is the root user. This is the user that can do everything. It has no problems with authorizations. It can write, overwrite, delete any file, any point in the operating system. It can open ports in within any range. It can do everything. The security people will tell you that it is not recommendable to use the root because one error might lead you to delete the entire operation. And well, the Nobody will question what you do if you use root, it will obey and do whatever you tell it to do. So for security reasons and also for mental health, the recommendation is not to use the root server. This is for very specific situations. I would recommend even blocking this user so that it couldn't be accessed through network interfaces and only through the local machine. So depending on the scenario, you have to be careful and protect this user. You have to include a password that is sufficiently strong, not leave it open because anyone who has access to the root user can do whatever that person wishes. They, that person has full control over the machine. The other type of users are the real users, the administrators, Alicia, Roberto, Guillermo, those who have access to the machines have a username and a password. And you can also authenticate through certificates. The most common thing is using a password. These are human beings, these are real individuals who have an account or a user in that machine. The third type of users are the services users. Normally, what many people do is when they have a web server and a DNS server or some kind of services like that, they do this using the roots user so that they have no issues with authorizations because they can do everything. So they run it with that user. And this is a problem from the standpoint of security. What would occur if you compromise a web server? The web server had a weakness, for example, a platform subject to attack. Hackers can access the web server, they compromise that. And because the runner, the service is running with the root user, that user has all the privileges of that machine. Ideally, from the standpoint of security, each of the services should have its own user and they should have restricted authorizations to do specific things. For example, a web server will have its own user. It could be called Apache or whatever, or it can just be called web. The user can be called web. So normally they don't have a password. They don't have a home in the machine. They don't log in with that. But when they run the service, they state execute the process or run the process, but using this user. This user is only authorized to do what it can do. It only has accesses, access to, sorry, to the website or access Super Bowl 80 but it is a restricted user. It cannot create more users. It cannot include more services. This is a totally restricted user. So in this way, it is much more secure when each service has its own user. We'll see later on that it's not necessary to set this up manually. So there are many packets that facilitates things very much. But it is important that you are aware why this is being done. Many of these things are doing are done
for reasons of security or ease, ease of use. Groups, users can belong to one or more groups. The groups can have any name. Normally, the user has its own personal group, but can belong to other groups as well. The group's command of the console is useful to know what groups we have been included in. I have a username that is Jorge, and Jorge, CD-ROM, sudo, audio, video, plug dev, net TV, and Docker. And why do we have groups? Imagine that you have servers and a group of administrators, instead of giving authorizations to access or to administer to each of the users. And when there is a new authorization, you have to adjust these things. You have to go to each one to change the authorization. The best thing is to have a group of, of administrators and assign the authorizations to those. So in that way, you can standardize things so that all administrators have the same authorizations. When you need to adjust these authorizations, you just go to the group, you change this in just one place, and all the users will have the same authorization. So that is a concept of groups. This is to facilitate managing the authorizations. I recommend doing this. This can be managed individually for each user, but this is not so simple. So it's much simpler to manage authorizations in a group compared to doing this individually. Filing authorizations. If you look at the console, you'll see a list of all the files contained in the directory. You will see an output that looks like this. The first section, the one on the left, shows the authorizations for each of these files. R is reading, W is write, X is setup. So this is a file, it's a binary, it's a script that can be executed in the machine. This is a bit difficult in terms of the directory. The directories should have the authorization to run. Otherwise, we cannot access these. So let's go by parts. The first one, if it contains a D, it's a directory. It's not a normal file. Or the files or the folders can contain more files. The next three are the user authorizations, the owner RWX, depending on what has been activated for that user. If this file belongs to me, I, if I created it, then these are the services that will apply. The next three are the ones of the group. Maybe that user, or C corrects himself, maybe that file does not belong to me but it has been assigned to the same group I belong to. So these are the authorizations that will apply in this case. And finally, the authorizations for other users. It's not the owner. It has not been assigned to a group I belong to. So then these are the authorizations that will be applied in that case. You see user groups, others, and if you remember Hugo, the name Hugo obviously is not an H, but if you remember you Hugo, user, group, other. It's a very simple way of recalling this, the order in which the authorizations are organized. The next states the owner of this file. The owner is a root user, and the next is the group. Almost all are root, except for the last one that belongs to the shadow group. This little file here, just as a curiosity, saves all the passwords of the users in the machine. If you pay attention, only root can write it. A 
and read it. But in the case of the shadow group, only those processes that belong to this group can read that file. All the rest cannot read this file. And this is meaningful because this file contains all the passwords of the users created in machine. They are not in plain text, they are cached, but for security reasons, only those can access it who have been authorized. In this case, root and the process that does, that starts the session have access to the all the rest are unable to read this. The next column shows the size of the file in bytes, in kilobytes or megabytes. And finally, the last changes, last modification. The filing system, as I was saying, in Unix and Linux, this is based on a tree. There is a root directory, and this creates all the files of the OS. It can have more than one. And it has a tree shape. You have a root directory and all the rest is changed. Each real user has a home directory this has authorizations where the user can write and create any type of file or directory in slash home. This can be set up, but normally this is done in this way. Where the user can write and create uh, any kind of file, music, text, whatever I need, I can create it there. The slash character is used to limit, uh, put a, to put a limit to, to the directories. Of course, uh, the one in, to the left uh, refers to the root uh, folder of the entire operation uh, OS, and from there you can uh, give sub directories. There are two ways you can show these routes. One is absolute, and that means from the root, we indicate which are the subdirectories divided by slashes until you get to a directory or a file or the relative way that depends on where we are at present in the OS. If we are, for instance, in our home directory, and we don't put slash at the beginning, that means that it's a relative route. For instance, a document, books, documentos, libros, is equivalent to the route on top, if we are in the home Jorge directory. This is important because maybe when we are creating scripts, the idea is to use absolute uh, routes. I'm going to indicate uh, the complete route of my file, but when we are working with uh, the uh, console uh, that is interactive, it's usually it's easier to use the relative routes, depending on where we are. You can indicate a file without having to define the entire route. So, so far, are there any questions, any comments? None so far, Jorge. Good. Okay. So now we're going to see the commands in Linux. Uh, they usually have the following format. It's not a, a mandatory standard, so not all the commands have this format. But I would say that most, or at least uh, the most common ones, use it. Basically, you write the command. You can indicate uh, the functions using uh, the minus uh, uh, sign. They're optional. Depending on the command, they may vary. And they may also have arguments that follow the command. We're going to see now how 
the how you would run the different commands. The idea with this webinar is not uh, to give uh, a comprehensive, uh, uh, exhaustive uh, uh, overview of all the functions of each command because it would take too long. But what I mean is as if it were a buffet that is to give you to try a number of commands and to see how some options of each are used basically so that you may know what is available, what is out there. And when you need something deeper to do something more specific in a command, you can just uh, ask uh, in the, uh, the manual or the internet. And But the idea is that you may have the feeling of uh, what the commands are like and uh, what is available and what you can do from the console without having to use uh, the interface. Um, this um, is now we are looking, you are seeing my local uh, ma uh, machine. It's a Mac, but usually we connect to a server using SSH, my username at um, and the, here I have a local server by my uh, machine so I can enter with a simple password we are in this is a, a machine with Debian and I can use the command who am I to see what username I'm uh, I'm uh, logged in so I can see what groups it belongs to Jorge and Sudo and with PW I can see PWD, I see what directory I'm in, I'm in home, and the ls command shows the contents of the folder with cd, I can switch the folder, here it uh, takes me to documents, and uh, with uh, txt I see the contents, and here I can uh, give a list of uh, the contents of uh, the file, here it's a uh, uh, Linux, it's a uh, libros t, uh, dot, uh, txt, but if I want to see just the first part of uh, the uh, file because it's very uh, larger then I use head and it shows me only the first lines and with n I can tell give uh, instructions as to how many n three it's the first three lines with cd dot dot I go back to the father directory a uh, directory back and the list ls list is gives you a list of the different directories i here i can put the bind directory within configs configs and this enables me to give a list of the contents without having to switch to the directory so this is the home directory and if for any reasons you want to see the history you can use the command history and it shows all the commands that have been run, right? Processes. Each program that each software that runs in your server, in your Linux uh, raises a process or they have a single identifier assigned by the OS and the OS, um, the operative uh, is in charge of assigning resources to the process, CPU, RAM, etc. These resources are limited, so uh, the uh, OS uh, seeks to distribute them in different processes. For instance, a web server running in Linux would have its own process and would assign CPU or CPU time or processor time depending on its phase. A process may launch uh, children processes. Uh, this is a technique that I used in the past when we started with the web. Normally, a web server would have its own process, and each uh, user request launched a, a child process to for the user. So the idea there was for the user processes to uh, run in parallel raising processes is a bit heavy for the OS, so the new techniques no longer use the scheme. They use other types of schemes, but in the past it was very common for web servers or 
HTCH or DNS servers or whatever, anything that would have to attend uh, uh, users. Each user would raise its own process for that user. It's no longer done that, like that, but in the past it was very common. Now we are going to see about the processes in the console. I have a script, whoops. Sorry. I have a script that's called Ola. Hello. It's very simple. It just writes Ola with uh, a different number in uh, uh, subsequent uh, each second. It's very, very simple. One, two, three, four. But in the end, it's a process. And to uh, and you can use Control Z. The process is suspended. It wasn't killed, it wasn't uh, aborted, it's just suspended. So we can go back to the console and collect other commands, uh, as in this case, uh, ls uh, to see the contents, uh, pwd to see what directory I'm in. And with fg, with that command, I can go back to uh, the command that I was running. FG, I go back to the command and I go on with what was I was doing. Now, if I put control C, now here I'm stopping the process. And if you look at this, I run a command. This was a very simple script. It's being processed in the console, but I might need to do something else. I So I press control Z, to stop the execution, I can run the commands that I need. And then when I want to go back to the uh, process that I had, I put again FG and I can resume with the command. If for any reason the command got stuck or, uh, or it's going to run indefinitely until I stop it, you can cancel it or you can stop its execution by using Control C. So we are going to see an example with bind. Bind is a DNS server, an open source uh, DNS server. It's not the idea to give an, an explanation of how it works and how it is set up. I'm just using it as an example. And the idea is to see how to configure it, how to execute it, to see to ch how to check whether it's really running and for you to realize how this is done in the console. We're going to see it two ways. This is the manual way. Then we're going to do it more automated. But um, first, we're going to see it in a manual way. So it's a it's an open source DNS server, very popular. It may run authoritative or recursively. And for many, it's the implementation of reference for the DNS standards. If you ever read the DNS standards, some of them, some of those scripts were written a long time ago in the 80s. So maybe the way they're written may be ambiguous or confused. When this happens, what people usually do is look at what bind does, and then that's what you should do. We're now we're going to see in the console again, we switch to config uh, slash bind. Uh, th that is a pre-made uh, uh, setup, a configuration. We list uh, the content of uh, the directory with ls. And here it's a uh, ls. Um, well, here, if you look at this, I use ls, but I sent an option minus l what this what this minus l option does is to show the uh, uh, as a list and it shows the the permits who's uh, the owner the files the size the last uh, modification so it gives you a, a lot more information if you send the argument or the minus l option mm. The control part is not very friendly. So as I said, 
earlier, you can list with ls or with minus ls minus l it provides you a bit more information and if you look at the size it's in bytes so you can add h so it will give you a more simple reading of uh, the size in this case with kilobytes when with uh, md you can run the dns server here it's already running but if you look it it blocked the console so we, there's nothing else we can do and if we log out the server will stop why because our uh process that we are running is is being run as a dns and when we kill the father process then the children also die so i stopped it with minus c or with control c and i no longer hear it i'm going to raise it again but in this case if the option without the option of minus g and what it does here is that it raises it but in a normal mode and this is known as the demon mode that is it's not linked to running in the console normally but uh, it is raised as an independent process and this independent process does not write in the screen it doesn't receive any more commands from the line it's just running already independently in the console and if you um uh leave if you look out the process will continue to run in this case as it's this is a test i'm not using port um, uh 853 that's the uh, the the 53 50, but 80 p 8053 for the test and uh, to see that the process is running or what are the processes that are running with the user uh, but um, user ps minus x so mm -hmm you will see that the bind is running this net start command is useful to list all the processes that are listening in a given port in the machine. In this case, the output shows, if you look in many of the IP addresses, which are all the IP addresses of the machine, in port 8053 in TCP and in UDP, some, they're listening to something, which is the DNS server that we are running. You also see a 22, which is the server for SCH. So here we can see which ports are listening in the machine with D, dig we can do a query to the dns server to see what it answers here we did dig at local host we're going to use a local machine or we're going to ask rather the local machine with minus p we indicate the port because we're not using the standard port we have to state the query is addressed at port 8053 and the question is i'm asking for the domain example.com and i'm asking the resolution in ipv4 the server answered and here we see the answer for the resolution of that domain name to this ipv4 address as i was saying i won't go into the details explaining how the DNS works. I was interested in how a process is picked up when executing it and how it runs independently from our console. Uh, virtually, we could say this continues running in the background and is not related or linked in any way to our console. So the service will continue being executed. Now we have a problem. What if we wish to stop the server for whatever reason, maybe it's no longer necessary, we want to cancel it, then we have to change the configuration and restart it. 
So if we don't have any contact with that process anymore because we launched it and then it runs independently, then we cannot recover control of the process because it is totally isolated from us. In that case, the way in which we can stop this process is through the process indicator. We can do that query with TS minus X. And with kill minus nine, we can stop or kill that process. Minus nine is to indicate the kill that has to eliminate the parent process or any offspring it has created. So if we do the query with PS, process 927 is no longer running, which was a DNS server, it stopped. And if we check with net start, it shows that there is no longer anything listening in this port where we were running the DNS. Now, what are the arguments that I'm sending here? Let me explain. L is list the ports where someone is listening. T is show the TCP, U is for UDP, DNS, is a protocol that listens to the two ports, both for TCP and UDP. And the N is to show the port numbers. Netstat has initial what shows when a port is used for something specific, for example, it's 22 SSH. Instead of showing 22, it just says SSH. Personally, I prefer to see the number 22 and not the translation. But if you wish to see the SSH or HTTP or the DNS, you just remove the N and it doesn't show the port and it shows the translation. So this is the example without the N. It no longer shows 22, it just shows SSH. In 68, it shows boot PC. So I now go back to my home directory. If you look, I didn't put CD colon CD colon to return to home. I just put the tilde indicating that I want to go back to the home. And then it doesn't matter in what part of the operating system I am or in the filing system I am. If I put CD tilde, it will show me to the home file. Any questions so far? Yes, Jorge, we have questions. We have a question from Graciela Martinez. Graciela is a coordinator of the CSERT of LACNIC and she's asking us the following. The dig query, can this be done even if we don't know what the port is? Is that so? So the question is, if you can put dig at localhost example.com or that is the A record, or if you put the localhost, is the port necessary? Well, that's a great question. The thing is that I had to define in what port I should send the query through because I did use port 53, which is a standard one. If you don't tell DIG what port to consult, it goes to the 53, which is a standard port. Because a server was listening in port 8053 and not in port 53, then it was necessary to indicate to DIG what port to address the query. But in a normal scenario where you're testing a normal DNS, you don't need to state the port. DIG will show it automatically to port 53 because that's a standard one. For the purpose of this example, I used another port. Basically, because I have another DNS server running in the AT53 and I didn't want to have any conflict and this was just a rapid demo. demo. That's why I ran this in a different port. But in a real life scenario, in a production scenario, the port that will be used is port 53, so it's not necessary to 
indicates to the DIG what port to use because it notes that 53 is a standard port and will do the query directly to that port. Thank you, Jorge. There are no more questions. Graciela is also says also thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Let's go on. Package managers. The packets have been created now in the sense of not having to download the source code and to set this up manually and to download dependencies and maybe having to know more about coding or developing to understand what is happening if you wish to set up a web server, a DNS server, or a mail server. Normally, there are packets available that you can download and execute and they will automatically set up the service that you require. These managers will download the packets then, what you wish to install, all the dependencies, and then execute these in such a way that you know that this will run in your Linux distribution. There are several, for example, APT. This is quite common in Debian and others such as Ubuntu and Mint, I think open source too. And then YUM, this is used by Red Hat, for example, Fedora, CentOS, they all use this manager. Then other distributions use Pac-Man and some other distributions use APK. For example, Ambine Linux, which is better? Well, this is personal old work in a similar fashion. The idea is to facilitate to the sysadmin the capacity to install packets in an easy and standardized way. The people who maintain these packets in these repositories take care that everything will run correctly, that everything will match, and also that these packets can be updated. These can be updated through these tools and that this they ensure that this will be done correctly. Of course, it's not 100% reliable. It's always important to test these first in a machine that is not the production machine to verify that everything runs smoothly. But normally, these are reliable and a very simple way of installing new packets or services in your server and not having to set up the source code manually. Let me give you a brief example. Let us first update the operating system. It's always important to update your operating system. To run commands, we use apt update. This is a Debian, so we use apt. I decided to use Debian because that's the one that I personally like most. But of course, this is just a matter of taste. There's no perfect distribution. There's no the best distro, no, no best distro. This depends on your needs, the one you're most familiar with, the, with the one you like most. Some say, well, my distro is better than yours, but I don't believe that is the case. You just select the one that fits you best. Some are focused on security, other are focused more on a desktop. So you have to find the one you like best. You can test two or three distros out and then decide which you like best. And then you can learn how to use it in a more complete way. So all the commands we have seen so far are universal commands for all the distros. So although I'm using Debian, these work exactly the same in other Linux distros. And many of the commands that we have seen also run in the Mac console. This, these are quite universal. Maybe Mac, because it's based on BCD and not so much on Linux, then 
the commands vary a bit more, maybe more than in distros, but the concept is quite similar. What does vary from one distro to the other is a packet manager. For example, APT is not exactly the same as APK or Pacman. They vary slightly in terms of their use, but the way they work and what they do is quite similar. So if you use CentOS, if you use some Fedora derivative or another manager, don't worry because the concepts are basically the same. The command line variations. So if your favorite one, favorite distro is based on Red Hat, then consult the June manual and you see that what we use with APT can also be done with June with some variations. I ran the APT update command and I get an error message. It shows error 13 permission. That is because I ran this command with one more normal user. My user doesn't have permissions. So in this case, in order to update the system, in order to be able to install new packets and services, you need to have permissions as administrator. One of the easy ways of obtaining is with a sudo command. The sudo states what you tell me to do, I will do as if you were a root. You're not a root, but I will run this as if you were a root. Of course, root should have given me the privilege of becoming, be, belonging to the sudo group and also to implement the sudo command. But this is an additional step that I have to follow in order to update the system. Of course, I could have logged in as a root user and then I could have run everything directly or give permanent permissions to the user that I can do just anything. But for reasons of security and to prevent errors or deleting files that should not be deleted, it is better that everything that is sensitive should be done through sudo instead of doing it with root. In this case, I run the apt update uh, command again. First, I put sudo so that it will enable me to run as with the uh, root uh, permits and then yeah, I can uh, execute the command uh, with no problems. It requests a password to check that it's me. Here it tells me that there are three packets to update. So I put apt upgrade and with, it will download the new versions of these commands. If you look at this, it's a very simple way you can maintain your server updated and now we are going to install bind and uh, um, so, so here it tells me whether I want to install 28 megas of packets. I say yes and it, it will finish now and now it's installed. Now we are going to install, I want a, a web server, let's install Apache and in this case the I put the argument minus G, so I won't have to put the Y to confirm, but it does it automatically. Now, if you look at this, in this small example, I installed a DNS with bind and a web server with Apache to uh, using just APT. And I also updated the OS to keep it updated. It's very important always to update the OS to have the latest versions already installed and so as to install uh, the APT services uh, more easily. So now,
we are going to configure our bind. This is an example that's a bit more real. Uh, already installed correctly with more uh, uh, standards. And if you look at this, the configuration commands are not in my user folder, but in another one that is called uh, ETC bind. This is a standard uh, 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 point to show where the configuration files are. So it's no, so if somebody comes and uh, uh, main, does the maintenance of their, they know that uh, this will be in this uh, uh, directory and not my personal um, uh, directory where they, they don't have a permit to access. So this is more standard and this is the way a DNS server should be configured and not so much running in my personal folder. So part of the installation process, the APT created a special user for bind to execute bind with that user in particular that has restricted permits. And they look at what if we, we the, the packet already did what we would have had to do manually. In this case, the, install, the installation has a configuration as an example that we are going to change um, so that we can uh, conduct the test but the people that maintain the packets in APT already left us a configuration that more or less works and that we can use as a base to configure whatever we need. The clear command is very simple. It just clears the screen. You see, it's empty. And what I like to do, well, let's first, let's see the contents of the configuration files using uh, cat. In this case, so the configuration is divided into uh, options, uh, local and default. Here, it tells us that we, um, it recommends that uh, we should uh, upload uh, this, this in this file before configuring, uh, 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 I, I always like to have a backup because if I make a mistake, then it's always good to have a backup of the original files before changing them. Here, I'm using the CP command for copy. I give the name of the copy that, I, the, the name of the file that I want to copy and the new name and this is a text uh, editor um, with a configuration file. Now here, I'm, I'm uh, changing a reading file, but that is not really the problem. The problem is that I made an attempt to change a file and root is the owner and I am not allowed to write on that. So the changes that I was going to make in that file, I was not going to be able to save them because I don't have the writing. So I'm going to call the DI uh, command and I'm going to say sudo vi and now I can edit the file as if I were the root, right? So if you look at this now, it tells me that I am modifying a read-only file. I'm going to check that it's not a recursive server. And I'm going to say that I won't allow the zone to be transferred by anyone. Allow transfer, none. We're going to see VI later, but with W, I write down the file and with the Q, I go out of the editor. Now I'm going to modify the, uh, uh, a file and I'm going to put the zone example.com and I will say that it's the master type. This server will be the master and uh, I say I say that my zone file is in this route and my recommendation is that it should be an absolute route to uh, avoid any confusions. So you put um, then 
bracket the semicolon and I now I copy from my home directory. You remember I'm going to uh, instead of writing the entire route I with fix and bind I'm go configs and bind I'm going to copy the entire zone and the dot shows that it's this directory. So I can run the named dot uh, the, the named uh, check off and to, to check uh, and if nothing comes uh, it's that it's correct and now yes I can put uh, sudo system control until status bind nine this command system control is the way you can control the services that are running in the machine. When you install through the APT, you also configure in system control that you confirm that the bind is running uh, in, and uh, the configuration, um, it, it, it shows you everything uh, so that you can control it simply through this control system control in this case it says uh, system control status to to ask in what uh, status is the server is and i put, give the name of the server uh, bind nine it was the apt that assigned this name it wasn't i so it's the way it installs it in other versions with june uh, or other uh, packet uh, handlers this name can uh, change but in debian it uses this bind nine nine because that's the version that's running in this example that we are seeing if you look at this in red it says that there was an error when running the bind or the server and this is because before uh, recording this video i i was checking and i made a mistake in the configuration and the server now is not running however with the changes that i made in the configuration if i uh, tell it to um to re start uh, the service now with now with the system control and now the server should run i put a restart and if we consult again now yes it tells us that everything is running smoothly now if you look at this in green it tells us it's active it's running it gives us some information whether it's running etc and i can use dig in this case i am not using minus p because it's already in port 53 that's the official one and we can see that it's uh, answering by the zone. So we go back to the home directory and with uh, the tar command, I, t I get a backup of all the configuration because I like to save a copy of the configuration that works just in case there are um, other modifications and to make a mistake, I will have a reference uh, of uh, what is uh, uh, happening. So here, for instance, there is a little uh, error. They, they, it can't read this ETC bind uh, RNDC because it only has a, a root uh, permit. And I don't care for saving that key i i wanted to save uh, the configuration and what tar does is to put together several files in a single one so if you want to see this um it's it's like a zip but with no compression it will just uh, put together all the files in a single one i'm going to explain this uh, how to run tar you put I put minus C V F C is to say I want to create a file and V is to show in the console the files that I'm saving and the F is um, here 
And the next one. And I want to save everything in this file. So here I will put together all the files uh, and uh, in a single one that is called uh, here. I list uh, the file. I put list and it needs a 20 case. This is the maximum compression file to compress this file. So this is 2.9 case. Let's create uh, backups, another folder. So I use uh, uh, M key dear and the mute to move. and I'm going to move to backups. You see that this is not in the base. So in list, I added a new option. What it does is to edit all the files in Linux. So I you have a, a, a bash history or bash log out or bash RC local profile, all the files and directories that start are not listed. These are not listed, they are hidden. But if you put A to the list command, Yes, we have a question from Lito Ibarra. Lito is telling us that he had to leave the meeting. We told him that the answer was recorded. So this is something that you already mentioned, but it is very important to centralize in one single question. He's asking us the different Linux implementations. Do these offer the same options in the commands or are there any major variations? Almost all use the same commands. I would say that the vast majority are the same commands. The big difference lies in the file manager. Normally, as I was saying a while ago, Debian derivatives like Mint, open source, they use APT as a package manager. In the case of the Red Hat derivatives, they use YUM. And then other distros that are not so common because I don't have that much experience. So that is the main difference compared to what we saw today, the manager. The copy, the move command, the CD, move, PS, kill. These commands are standard commands and you'll find these in all the distros. This does not change. The main difference is the packet manager. And when you set up something, set up something through the packet manager, they don't exactly follow the same locations for the names of the servers or how to set these up, which can vary. This is because they have a name when you create the packet and they don't always use the same name. For example, when we set up Apache in ABT, 
and Devian, the name of the packet is Apache 2. And if I'm not mistaken, for all the distros based on Red Hat, the packet is called HTTP or HTTP2, I don't quite recall. It's not called Apache, it's called HTTP. So what is the name? Well, the one defined by the person who did, created this packet, and this can vary from one distro to another. But at the end of the day, they do the same thing. They install a service that has a name that is configured in a given way, and you can set this up through the file. Maybe the name of the file can vary, and the location, but the way of setting this up, if it is not identical, it is very similar. This is just a matter of reading the manual or the documentation of the packet manager or even the people in charge of maintaining the service or the code. This in order to see these smaller differences, but if you understand the concepts and what is happening, well, what I can do with Debian in this way, what will happen in Fedora. So you will find this in Google without any issues, but all the other commands, copy, moving files, permissions, users, all these are standard for all the distros. There are no more questions so far. So let us go on. So let us now look at the web server we installed, we installed an Apache by default in Debian, at least, you have an Apache server, and this includes a welcome page, welcome to Apache. This is a very simple page containing information on the server as such. Of course, when you set up a website or a service that you, is web-based, this default page is changed for what you wish to include in your server. One of the ways of checking what the server is providing. Very simple is through the curl command. This command downloads this web server's files. In this case, we include the server name, HTTP colon slash slash and the server name, and then you can download the website that is there by default. It didn't go back to the HTML. It's not interpreting this in any way. It just returns information on the default page, and we can see that the server at least is running. So trying to read this is not very user-friendly. So curl has another option, which is minus I, uppercase, and instead of showing us the content of the website, it just provides the information on the headers. In this HTT1, dot 200 shows that everything is running normally and includes more information. I'm setting up a browser called Links. This browser is like a Chrome or a Firefox, but it is for consoles. Of course, it cannot, sh cannot show images, but it interprets and shows the best it can the websites here we see the default page installed by the Apache server. But we can see just any website. For example, we can put Wikipedia. Maybe it might ask us about the cookies if we wish to accept these. And we can just consult any website. The result varies. There are some things that it can do and others it cannot. We can use Wikipedia. We can look LACNIC in Wikipedia, for example. We can do the query. It's a bit slow, but here we see the Wikipedia page with information on LACNIC. 
and it tries to do it the best way possible regarding the styles. It shows which are the links, but we can browse from one link to another. We're also using space bar to go to the next page. Here went to the LACNIC page and then to the NICVR page. And this is just a curiosity. It's not for your everyday work, but it's a fun way of consulting a website in this console. This console is sufficiently powerful in order to have a very functional browser with the limitations that it cannot show images or different font sizes. Nevertheless, it can be useful for a rapid query if we need it. And this is done through this browser called links. L Y N X. Now let us look into how to use the commands jointly. We have been using commands uh, in isolation. So we run a command and we see the result. However, Unix which is what Linux is based on, has the philosophy that each command should do just one thing and it should do it properly. The commands should not be complex. They should be quite simple. They should do just one thing. These commands can be joined. So the output of a command can be the input for a second command. For example, command one, command two, and then I can add commands. In this case, the output for command one will be the input for command two. The com output of command two will be the input for command three. And we can proceed in cascade form until we have n number of commands. Let me give you an example. Let's create a directory with make dir temporary. We need to copy from the documents for the txt file on books, libros, will change to a temporary file that we created. We can list the content. We copy the libros, the books file, a cat to recall what this file contains. It's just a list of books with the author will tell which shows us the last files of the, uh, the tail. It, I can indicate how many lines I wish to have, the last three lines of the file. But if I put the plus sign and floor, it says, give me all the lines starting from line four. So I no longer show the header that I had at the beginning of the file. So I will stop here. And if you look here, I ran tail again to include all the lines starting from line four. And I include a pipe here to join this command with this other command called sort. So the sort command is organizes this in alphabetical order. If you pay attention, the output I have for the names of books have been organized in alphabetical order, not in the original order of the file. These have now been organized in alphabetical order. trying to sort, I'm going to use the AWK with minus F. So I'm going to say that the separator is going to be a comma space. Print only the second column. So the second column are the authors. First column includes the name of the book, comma, space, and author. So in this way, I just print the authors. But I can join this again with sort and I can organize the authors in alphabetical order. 
and I can include a different command used unique, which eliminates those that have been repeated. If I put unique minus T, it will then show me how many times the author or text appears in the list. For example, Agatha Christie appears only once, Carlos Ruiz Alfon twice, Gabriel Garcia Marquez just once. And this output once again can be organized using minus C with sort and minus R. So you can organize it in alphabetical order, but the other way around. And also top down, which are the, sorry, these are the ones that appear most. Stephen King appears three times, George R.R. R. Martin twice, Carlos Ruiz, Ruiz Safon twice, and then all the others appear just once. So I will now explain each of these commands and what each command does and how this is linked to the next point. I first started with tail minus n plus four to indicate that from the book file, I want to have to list all the lines starting from line four. In this way, we remove the heading, which said favorite books. Then this pipe sends the output to awk. This is a common command to parse text. So with minus F, it says this should be separated with a comma space. And I want you to print the second column. AWK will parse two columns. The first was the title of the book and the second, the authors. But I want you to print on the screen or on the console just the second column, which are the authors. This output I organize through the sort command. And once this has been organized, I send it to the unique minus C command. So it removes those have been listed more than once and shows me how frequently that text appeared in the output. In this case, I will see how many times that author appeared in the text. Then this is sent to the sort command with a minus R, indicating that it should organize the results starting with number three, two, and one. So if you pay attention, we remove from the books.txt I had, the libro, the books, Dot txt, which are the authors that appear most frequently in the list without counting them one by one, just using the Linux command. Um, this is a very small file, but imagine that it's a hundred books, very large. It would have been very complicated to do it. Uh, manually. So here we, this is a rapid way of doing it, just using Linux commands and uh, um, uh, linking them through like. Now, if you want to save uh, the results in a file, you can also do it. And instead of using bind, I'm you going to use uh, greater than, and I'll say that I will send it to quintus.txt. So if I query the directory again, you see that I have a, a file that is called quintus.txt with a, a cat. I see the contents and I see the contents. And this, um, we put this, we saved this uh, in this uh, file in the hard disk, if you want to consult it, uh, whatever we want to do with it. Any questions about this? This is a bit uh, more difficult. Yes, we do have questions, Jorge. Jose Andrade says the following. 
Good morning. I'd like to know if there is and what would be the equivalent in Linux of the .bat files. We're going to see that, yes, they're called slips. Usually they have the .sh extension, but it's not necessarily, but the, the standard determines that um, most cases we do it. Yes, and we're going to see it later in the presentation. Excellent, Jorge. Thank you. Let's go on. We are going to have a small game with our file uh, Libros.txt, and now we're going to change the order. Instead of having the title of the book, comma, author, we're going to put author, comma, in the, tit the title of the book. And the first thing that we'll do is to remove the final dot at the end of each line. We're going to remove that dot. We are going to uh, put AWK, the two columns, title and author. We're going to put them the other way around, putting a comma and then the dot at the end. That's what we are going to do now with uh, Linux. We Let's remember what uh, the uh, this file had, uh, Libros.txt with tail. We are going to remove the first three lines, uh, the header that we have there. And we put a new command that's called sed. What sed can do is to remove text. In this case, I'm saying remove the last dot in each line. You see that it no longer has the final point of the name of the author with AWK. We are going to form the two columns. And in this case, you can say print column two, comma, space, column one, period, right? And we can run it. We should have the text, first the author, then the title. You have three Linux commands and very simply, we could patch uh, the text. If, if we had done this manually, it would have taken us a long time, even more if it's a long, a great large file, but we could do it very simply, very quickly. And this is very good when you have configuration files or if you want to modify uh, rapidly. If for instance, I have configuration files with a certain IP and you know, well, we are not going, and it may say, we're not going to use this IP. So you ask it to change the IP using these commands very quickly, very simply, without uh, many problems. And it's much faster and less prone to errors than if we had to do it by hand. Imagine if you have to enter into each file, copy the name of the author, put it at the beginning, delete, it would be a chaos. With these commands, we could do it very, very simply uh, it, without any special uh, uh, software. It's very simple, very powerful. Each command is very simple. It does just one thing, but it does it quite well. And we can link them very simply by using the pipe. VI. Okay. VI is a text editor. It's uh, the, the most common one by default in uh, the Linux uh, distributions. It's uh, flexible, powerful, and extensible, but it has quite a steep learning curve. It's not so easy to use. However, it's the most uh, common one. And it's almost uh, certainly installed by default. It has three operation modes, normal, that we can launch through the file, insert, to insert a new text or to modify the text, and a visual mode to select the text. 
So I could have used uh, the VI that comes by default in Linux. Now, just for the purpose of the presentation, I'm going to use the VI that is installed in my Mac that have logins uh, that, to, to show it nicer. The functionality is exactly the same. However, be, just uh, for the sake of the presentation, it's easier to show you um, this uh, so that you may see the change between the virtual, the normal uh, way. It's easier to see it like this that than with the text. That's what uh, why I'm going to use it. And this is used um, exactly the same in the plugin versions of Linux. Of course, in Linux, you can install these uh, uh, plugins, but they are not going to be installed by default. So here we entered VI and we are going to put the file keycode.txt and this is the normal mode that has this header and this in yellow. And we can move as in any text editor with the arrows or with H, J, K, L with those keys. And if you look at this, we can move one by one with the letters H, J, K, L, um, normally I don't use them. I use the arrows in the keyboard because when VI was created, there was no uh, keyboard standard. Um, so there were some, so you can use these letters in all the keyboard to move in uh, the file. As I said, for me, it's more natural to use the arrow, so that's why I do it. But if you are VI lovers, they, you probably use H, J, K, L to move. It's a bit more complicated, but if you want to do it, you can do it. Another way you can move through the text is with the W. You see that there you go from one word to the other with the W, and with a B, we can go backwards, word by word. Now, if we put the E, we go to the last letter of each word. With a, a capital G, we go to the end of the text. And with GG, you go to the beginning of the text, right? So if you look at this, we can very easily uh, work with the text with the keyboards. We can go to the beginning, to the end, uh, two dots, and you see the number of uh, the lines. We go here, uh, um, uh, semicolon uh, four, and uh, you go to line four. If if you want to look for the slash Quixote, for instance, search, we put N to look for the next match, and so for each of the times uh, that you you see here, you find the word Quixote. This is the normal uh, mode. This is simply to navigate through the text. So we're going to see the addition mode that is insert. So here we are again in the normal way, and we go back to insert. And here we can write in the text with escape. We go back to normal. And with a capital A, I can go to the end of the text. And I right away enter in the addition mode and we can add it more easily to the text with x i can delete i put again insert and i can write this again and put the word again right with gg i can copy or y wait why why uh, and with p i can paste with double d i can delete the text it's like a cut and I can paste it again, right? We are going to replace a colon and then I'm going to, to replace Quixote with a J, 
with an X and so it changed it only in the line where I was standing. But if, uh, if I want to change that in all the text, I can run the command again. But if, instead of using S, I'm use, going to use the percentage and S. And now it's going to change all the times that uh, Quixote is spelled with a J, it's going to change it with an X. And with a W, I can write a file, but if I give another name of a file, it's going to write it in the other file and not in the one I'm in now. So here I put it in Quixote with X. Um, and finally, with the U, I can remove all those changes. I can undo everything that I had done step by step with a W. That's to undo. No, sorry, with a, with a U, not with a W. And with colon Q, it's to leave the editor. And we're going to see the visual mode. Let's go back to the editor. This is the visual. Here you go with UV and you can copy this with a Y and paste it with a P. The visual mode is just to select text, to copy it, to delete it, to run commands. So that is why you use the visual mode. Now, if you don't want to use VI because uh, you need a very steep uh, learning curve, there are other text editors such as Nano, although they're not always installed by default, but it's easy to install with uh, APT or with Juno, and it's more common. Um, so more like a, a notepad or a word. It's easier. So you have the commands at the bottom for copy, paste, and exit. There is the problem with the text outside ASCII 7. It's not showing it correctly, but this is a configuration error on my behalf. Nano should be able to handle this without any issues. So I recommend taking a look at VI. You'll find this in all the default distributions. It's most powerful. It's most flexible. You can do many things with that, but it can be a bit complicated to use and to learn at the beginning. which are simpler to use. So you decide just what you prefer. I personally like VI a lot. It's the editor I use by default in my Mac, in my personal computer. That's why it has plugins and it looks nicer in my Mac because I have added some configurations. Now, once you learn how to use it, you really like using it. It's most powerful and very flexible to the that is why there are many things that are simply to use compared to a normal editor but there are no absolute truths this is more a issue of preferences and what you prefer to use the important thing is that there are options out there and the idea is to find what is suits better your requirements so we're almost done there are a couple of topics that we can rapidly go through. We have seen how to copy files, to move files, how to set up servers, edit texts, and other issues. But there are other commands that are used for administering the server. For example, reviewing, revising the available spice in the hard disk, to revise what processes are consuming more resources, to verify the parameters and the connectivity of network, to check the log files. So these can also be viewed from the console. So let us look at the top command that shows us which 
processes are consuming more memory and more CPU. The machine is not doing very much at this moment. That is why there are no processes that are consuming a lot of CPU. You can read the memory. The ma machine has a giga, but we're also only using 21 megas. With the command clear, we clear the screen with TF. You can see the available space, sorry, in the hard disk. If we want to see how much space a file occupies, we can put, you see, for example, download has 124 megas. And if we put address show, then we see all the list. You can assign, add, remove, and the classical ping, if you can reach a given machine through the network. Here I'm doing ping 248, which is a desktop. These are very simple commands that can be used to manage your server. Scripting. Scripting is where I saw there is a question and the equivalence of the bad files of Windows in Linux. That's scripting. These are scripts that allow you to automate, automate repetitive tasks, allows you to execute several commands with just one instruction. It can assist in standardizing several servers. The script ensures that the servers are all configured in the same way. It allows you to prevent human errors because ultimately you're not doing this manually and the script won't make any mistakes. You just run the script. Let us see a script now. Let's have a look at a script. We're going to create a clock with a command date. It prints the current date and time. And this is a root server that we have in our home. We're going to put touch to create an empty file, reloj, which is clock, reloj.sh. And if you pay attention, search mode, we're going to the change mode, will authorize execution to all, A. And now let us edit this file. Let us create a small script. It's going to call, be called bash. We put white true do. It's the one that's going to be iterating on and on to a variable. Now we're going to save the result in date. And we're going to print file on the screen. Slash R is to go to, big, to the beginning of the line. We're going to sleep for one second. And with done. We're going to close the cycle. When I exit the editor, now to run this, I put dot slash reloj dot sh. And our script is now running. As I put slash r, it wrote on the same line with control C. I can stop it. And before running this, with this C command, I can stop the execution. It just prints the current date and time. This is not very useful. But nevertheless, you can create these installation scripts where you can install software. just running one script. This is much more useful. I'm going to list a script that I prepared to set up the exporter mode. The export node exporter exports metrics for the Prometheus system. Until then, no packet manager existed. So this script downloads the source code, it compiles, no, it downloads a binary, he cracks himself. It sets this up. 
it includes this in a specific directory. It creates a user to and limited permissions. It links this to the system D in order to control this from the system control. So all this setup and installation is done with this script here. So let us list it with the cat command. And if you pay attention, the file is much bigger than what you see on the console, but I can put mode more, sorry, and I can view it section by section. This is a far more complete script with comments, but all these are commands that we saw today. I'm going to edit it with VI, so you can see with the colors, VI can show when this is text, when these are comments, when these are commands, which are in yellow. This is the APT to update the operating system. We have make dear to create files. RM is to delete, change mode is to change the operation mode. All the permissions, he corrects himself. Move to move directories or files and those issues. So if you pay attention, this is a far more complete and complex script. It does has functions, it does validations, it checks the downloads, it configures files, it creates users. So it's much more complete. So instead of doing all this manually in each machine, I have a script. I run this just once and will carry out all these tasks. So it is the equivalent of a bad file. This is for the purpose of doing the setup. I don't, I won't go into the details and the syntax as to how these scripts are created. You can check that individually. Otherwise it would take very long, but believe me, this is very, very powerful and very flexible. You can do many things with these. So that would be all on my behalf. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Jorge, let me tell you, we have no more questions. But before giving the floor back to Sandra to close the webinar, we have many people congratulating us on this webinar. People really enjoyed this tutorial. So I wanted to say that while everyone is still online. So that would be all. And if you agree, we'll give the floor back to Sandra so she can close this webinar. If you have any questions, you can if you, you, please feel free to contact me. Thank you, Jorge, thank you so much. Thank you for this excellent presentation. I think all the participants have enjoyed this. I'd like to thank Mariela for reading out the questions of the participants. So thank you very much to everyone. And we look forward to seeing you in LACNIC 37. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you.